Do I have to say got it? So now we're recording. So welcome and welcome also to anyone who's watching this video who hasn't seen uh, one of the recent talks for a long time since I haven't been here. So uh, I was just saying that we'll start with a meditation and uh, in this retreat I had a lot of interesting stuff happening you know it wasn't a uh, just one of those, sometimes retreats are sort of on a trajectory. You feel like the longer you sit, the deeper you go, more and more content, like nice and smooth. And I think sometimes we get into this idea that that's what a retreat's supposed to be. I don't know who tells us this, but maybe just whatever we're used to seems like the norm. But this time I really had a lot of different mental states and different emotions and it would really go like in waves, in phases. And so I was practicing with all kinds of different methods, sometimes doing very little in my practice, you know, sitting there and just hanging out with myself. Other times using skillful thoughts, speaking to my mind nicely. I, just, I coined the term love language for the mind, LL4M. <laughs> Love language for the mind, so I use that. And uh, I did quite a lot of investigation this retreat. It was more of an insight retreat, I think, digging a bit deeper on that particular aspect of the path, um, using the tools of, you know, Anicca Sanya, reflecting on, well, experiencing the impermanence of various mental and emotional states, uh, which are always, you know, mirrored in the body. You can always find that. Most easily, I think, at the level of sensation. So anyway, I wanted to share some of the things that I've been doing. And uh, one of them came up today. I was in a group, um, an LGBTQIA plus uh, Buddhist group. And uh, they reminded me, or I reminded them, I forget, that some of my practice was uh, receiving metta. So rather than practicing metta, especially when I was tired or when it just felt like too much, like I still have to do stuff, I still have to, you know, make myself feel good. It's like, no, you can just sit there and receive metta. So actually that was really nice. And uh, so we might do a bit of that, but we'll start in the usual way and uh, get comfy in our bodies first of all. So please take your time and uh, ask yourself if you have already, decided how to sit, if that's really the best for you at this moment, or if you're doing it just because you usually sit like that. What does your body want right now? And sometimes when we close our eyes, that's the time that we receive more data in the physical world, in the body. And we experience the body always through sensation. How do you know you have a body? What are the feelings that tell you you're sitting here now in this present moment? It can be any feeling. Maybe some sensations are more prominent than others. And check if any of those more intense sensations could be eased by shifting your posture, loosening a limb. You all know my habit, <laughs> it's every time actually. My heels are just a little bit too far pressed into the thigh or pressed into the opposite shin. I like to give them more space and a little bit of space for my toes to move. If you're sitting on a chair, you might notice a tendency to have your ankles inside the knee, not like inside it, but under the knee. And if you put your ankles slightly forward from the knee, it relieves any pressure. You might find you've tried to establish a very erect spine. Just check whether it's erect, but also relaxed. Likewise, if you're slightly bent over, hunched, contracted. Perhaps take a breath, an in-breath, and just see if you can very gently lengthen through the spine.
noticing the parts of the body touching the earth to feel grounded. And also that length through the back, space above the top of the head. Welcoming yourself into this space, your own immediate physical environment, which you've offered to yourself as a beautiful gift of solitude. Hopefully no one can come in, ask you a question, disturb you too much. And also this communal space, of people who are so well known to us by now, we trust, we share our love for the Dhamma with. We might not know each other well, but it doesn't even matter. Sometimes we feel closer to relative strangers who are on the same path than we do to our own family work colleagues, even friends. Just recognizing that you're safe, you're welcome, and you belong. Perhaps you sense the body relaxing with that recognition, softening, expanding a little bit. And if your mind's not quite centered yet in the present, it's still reverberating a little bit around the past, or ahead of itself. Notice how easy it is to become present again, simply by contacting any sensation happening now. present moment is always so close, so accessible. So if you'd like, you can remain just with this simple present moment awareness. Or I'd like to invite those who wish to join me in a, a little body scan, which will combine with the breath. So this is not something you have to get right. Try hard to perform. It's just an invitation to receive the breathing into each and every part of your body from the tips of the toes. So noticing any sensation in the toes or if that's difficult in the soles of the feet. Sending all your loving awareness to that part of the body. 
So if your toes, your feet were the most important thing in the world right now. And if you can, become aware of your breathing. Imagine that breath being received through the toes, through the feet. So that with every in-breath, the toes receive this wonderful life-giving oxygen. With each out breath, they relax that little bit more. Just imagining the breath coming in through the toes, through the feet. Spreading to each and every cell. Through the bones, the flesh, the skin. And we're going to gently keep spreading our awareness up through the shins, calves, to the knees. Sensing, receiving any sensation along with the breath. So the breath will filling up the entire lower leg. And then being released back. the trees, the plants. Allowing this breathing, this breath to massage any pain, tightness, throbbing, tension. Just relaxing with the rhythm of the breath. In your own speed, you can continue like this to the shin, sorry, the thighs. Staying connected to the breath. Imagining your thighs receiving the breath. So they were breathing. Moving up to the buttocks, seat of the trunk, and all around the buttocks to the hips. Allowing this part of the body to be breathed. The oxygen feeding each and every cell.
moving up through the trunk. You may want to start with the back or the belly. Just allowing the whole trunk, the torso, to receive the breath. Noticing any sensations in that area. Maybe many different types of sensations there. Doesn't matter, you don't need to give them a name. Right now I do have slight cramp in the stum stomach. And I'm just allowing the breath to help me to sense into that a little more deeply. Allow the breathing to open it up. So the breath will massaging my intestines. Moving up. to the chest, to the top of the back, the ribs, the side of the trunk, the armpits. I'm really enjoying this breath that's so easily felt in this area. Relaxing into the rhythm. Perhaps noticing the breathing, filling up the chest all the way to the collarbone, even up into the shoulders. Soothing out, smoothing out any creases, tightness, crunched up feelings in the shoulders. And feeling the fingers. Or if you want, you can go from the shoulders to the hands. Moving through this area to the breathing. Perhaps by now sensing the subtle difference in the energy of the in-breath and the out-breath. The hands coming back up 
through the shoulders to the neck. Breathing through the neck. to the jaw, underneath the chin, mouth, cheeks, mouth, Perhaps noticing more sensations of breathing in the back of the throat or top of the nose, upper lip. Wherever you feel any sensation, you're just staying with the breath. Allowing it to swirl around any areas of tightness or tension. The eye sockets, temples, brow. And sensing into any sensations in the scalp area, across the top of the head and all around the sides of the head, the ears. So your whole body is filled with the breath. Perhaps experiencing the body breathing as one unit. So you were taking in the breath through the skin, through each and every pore. Drinking it in and allowing it to release. Just relaxing. So you're being breathed. And if it works for you, we might bring to mind that throughout the world there are many people meditating right now. Or 
perhaps sending metta to all beings everywhere. Some of these beings are powerful, pure-hearted, noble beings. See if you can imagine receiving this metta with each and every breath. So the breathing were now infused with an unconditional, universal loving kindness that's available to you. If it works for you, you might imagine the Buddha himself sending you metta. Or any other archetype that represents loving kindness, compassion to you. And you're just being bathed in this love. Receiving metta, the way a baby receives metta in the arms of a loving parent or guardian. They don't have to do anything, be anyone. They're just loved. Recognizing that just as you're receiving or imagining, you're receiving this metta. We're all receiving the same metta together. We're all held without discrimination, preference, excluding anybody. We're all held in this beautiful, universal loving kindness that is available in this universe.
So if you're enjoying this meditation, you can continue to allow yourself to dissolve into this feeling of universal, unconditional kindness and metta. And if you are ready to come out of the meditation, we'll do so really slowly. So don't open your eyes fully, just open them very partially so you're glancing down eyes half shut and continue to sense into your breath, your presence. Just sitting, receiving, breathing and close your eyes again. When you're ready, you may try this again. Come out slowly, opening your eyes just a little bit. Staying connected to any sensations, to the breath, whatever is present for you. See if you can maintain some kind of connection to your inner world, even while we get into the Dhamma reflection together. <clears throat> so I hope. I'm not even going to say that I hope you feel refreshed or that I hope you feel peaceful. I hope you feel just what you feel. That's the most important thing of all, right? <laughs> and this was a theme in my retreat as well, because uh, sometimes I think most of the time we can go into retreats with subtle expectations, a sense of, well, Maybe I don't expect jhanas and enlightenment, but, you know, a retreat should be good for me. A retreat would be peaceful, would be um, relaxing. Maybe I'm feeling more resourced. Maybe I'm feeling more energetic, you know. And people say these things to me with the most beautiful intentions. And, of course, that is internalized. And this is what we come to meditation for, of course, right? Is it? Is it really the reason we come? Or is that a product of our practice? Is the reason really to understand suffering? And it's been an interesting retreat for me because I felt like I've almost been uh, learning the foundations all over again, <laughs> learning the fundamental tenets of the practice and of Buddhism and this is why I guess I call the talk the ultimate rebellion because it's so counterintuitive to the usual way of the world in life we want to do things to get something to feel better about ourselves to improve to progress to become peaceful to be more productive you know many people have said to me now you'll be more refreshed you can go back into your teaching role and do all the work you were doing before. And I'm thinking, hmm, not sure that's the purpose <laughs> because the life of a monastic is a movement towards simplicity and letting go. So for me, it's been a challenging retreat in many respects. And, um, you know, at times it was almost, I was thinking challenging, but, and also, but I think challenging and therefore very productive. Uh, very productive of insight and hopefully some resilience. Uh, I think Pema Chodron has a, a quote. She says, we, we have to develop distress tolerance. This is what meditation is about. It's 
about so many things, but that's a really nice way to put it because of course, in this practice, the very first thing, the very first uh, um, teaching that the Buddha gave is that there is suffering and this is the first noble truth. So this has to be seen. We have to find a way to open to this truth, to accept that this is one of the realities of life and you know, resisting that reality is actually perpetuating the problem. So I found for myself with this retreat, um, you know, I think I said at the beginning, it was uh, almost four months. And this was on the back of about a year and a half of complete, not complete isolation, but the first part was, I mean, I really didn't see anybody um, during the first part of lockdown with COVID. And then just towards the end, you know, in the last two, three months, I was meeting a few people outside who I'd got to know sort of later on, really, towards the end of the Zumi Bikuni first, you know, sort of year and a half. And um, I don't think I really anticipated how the extended solitude might affect me because I love solitude. And last year in Oxford, I had a wonderful time, whatever a wonderful time means. I was very, very content. It was one of those much more predictable, sort of stable, uh, contented periods of my life. And of course, I think that was partly because the little Vihara in Oxford had already become a community hub. It had, had very good energy, you know, lots of people, well, not lots, but a constant flow of people who'd been practicing there. So there had been a meditation vibe and an energy building up. And then leaving Oxford was actually a little bit disorienting for me because now here I found myself in rural Wiltshire, a place I've never been, even though I'm English, I don't relate too much to the to English culture. I left when I was 18, basically, and lived most of my life in Asia. So I hadn't actually lived in rural England as an adult before. And uh, it's beautiful and tranquil. And, you know, I'm very happy that, uh, that I have this opportunity because it has been incredibly supportive, you know, even in times of uh, feeling a little bit on the edge of that place where solitude meets isolation, you know, because solitude is something very beautiful and healthy that we um, move into from a place of resource as a, a choice, I would say. Yeah? Whereas isolation is something a little bit different when that um, sense of solitude become, it slips into loneliness, it slips into feeling of disconnection or even being really on the edge of society. I mean, anywhere as a non you are, but in my role, it's extremely marginalizing to be the only bikuni you know, in this uh, country. I think now there's another, but I don't know if she's staying here. But anyway, still, I'm the only one in this particular role. And so at times it was very interesting to see what the mind would do with that, you know. And, uh, you know, this is really a place, I think, that we have to get to in our practice. It was interesting for me because I have another teacher aside from Ajahn Brahm, and I spoke to him too at one point in the retreat. And, uh, you know, I had a, a, some peaceful meditation. It wasn't all, you know, extreme or a struggle, but also my mind went to some darker places and some places of questioning what I'm doing, some, you know, depression. I think also some perimenopause kind of hormonal stuff was there. So, and these sorts of emotions would, would change depending on the conditions, right? And also depending on how I would build the story around it all. And uh, at one point I spoke to this other teacher and I said, you know, I don't know if this is really working. <laughs> that thing that everybody says and that you've all probably said to a teacher or to me before. And I would say, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean? Is it working? And I said, oh yeah, because I know it's a stupid question. I said, well, you know, at least that I'm going to feel more energized. I'm going to feel resourced. And he just looked at me and he said, what, what's supposed to happen on retreat? And I was like, oh, that's right. I'm resisting what's actually happening. You know, with this idea that something else is supposed to be happening. And who am I to say that, right? This is the problem with the sense of self. It gets involved and thinks it knows better. But what we have is exactly where we're meant to be. And now I'm not saying this is always a good place. I'm not saying that, you know, 
no matter what the difficulties are, they're going to make you stronger because that simply obviously isn't true. You know, people do have mental health crises. People do have suicidal thoughts or even, you know, do take their own life very sadly when those support networks let them down. And I don't think this is the problem of the individual. This is a societal problem, you know, and it's harder for people who are marginalized, you know, for whatever reason, whether through race, whether through um, sexuality, gender, which is a big thing in the monastic tradition, there are studies that have shown inequality increases anxiety, and it's one of the biggest predictors, actually, of uh, mental health issues, inequality, because there's this concept of, you know, someone has to be superior or inferior, someone has to be more privileged and underprivileged. And I think it's also the basic sense of belonging that is so important for us. And so I was very fortunate because I have some tools to work with difficult or challenging emotions and thoughts. And I have a beautiful place, thanks to everybody in this community, to be able to dig a bit deeper into this. But still, I could see I was making the beginner's mistake and resisting it. You know, so sometimes I'm thinking, OK, maybe I should do more loving kindness because I'm feeling a bit down. And so I try and do loving kindness. And that would work for a bit. And then work, what does it mean? <laughs> Feel better, right? But what does it matter? <laughs> because the point is not the type of experience we have, but how we understand our experience. And so I realized after a while that even, you know, after so much practice, the tendency in all of us to use our, even our meditation as a very, very subtle way to start manipulating um, our experience, to start bargaining with suffering, trying to pacify it, trying to make it go away. And it can be so subtle because you think I'm just being present, but you're being present with a very subtle agenda to make samsara more palatable. Now, why do we want to do that? You know, Why is it that we want to feel that this is okay and I asked myself this question and I realized it's because it's much more scary not to have a sense of self even than to have a sense of self that's suffering so we own our suffering you know we identify with it it's like we claim the truckload of dong <laughs> you know Things that arise in the body and mind are completely impersonal, they're conditioned, they arise, they pass away, we can see it. But it's almost as though we make the impersonal personal. I realized we're creating this delusion of a self, you know? It's not that it's a given. We actually have to do something to create and sustain a sense of self. It actually takes effort. Because when you really look with clear eyes at what's happening, you know, there's not a little person behind your eye sort of seeing things and another little person in the air to hear something or, you know, another little person in the tongue. <laughs> it's not that these consciousnesses that could be possibly be a person. For a start, there are six of them, right? So if the eye consciousness is me, is that all I am, like an eye? Or there's a thing there, like a person? <laughs> Or if I am, you know, touch consciousness, body consciousness, is that, is that a person in there? Being conscious of touch. You know, is there a person in the mind being conscious of what I think or hear or feel or, you know, conscious of any of the input at the other sense doors? That's a harder one because we do tend to think that the mind is always there. The mind is behind everything else. The, the five senses are the play of the world, but the mind is the one who knows. But actually, you know, when you go deeper and you start to see everything is arising and passing, it, this contact to any of the senses is just, you know, coming and going at a very fast speed, let's say. I was going to say the speed of light, and it probably is something close, but it's very fast, you know, especially when you get into observing this impermanence. Um, and, of course, the mind would have to be keeping up with that because it's arising and passing. I mean, if the mind is knowing this, then the mind must be arising and passing too to keep up with it, right? So actually what it is, and this is not something that I've experienced to the point where I can say, you know, I've broken through to being an area, but those who have, have seen very clearly that one of the five sense consciousnesses arises. So for example, 
the eye, if you're lucky to have an eye, or two eyes that work, you know, you're not blind and you can see. The eye consciousness only arises when the eye comes in contact with a visual form. Because of the contact between the two, eye consciousness arises. It's not there before that. You know, and it's the same with the ear sense door, it's the same with the nose sense door, the tongue, the body, um, and the touch. We it doesn't arise, that particular consciousness doesn't arise unless there's contact. There has to be contact for those things to arise. You know, and this can be experienced in deep meditation when the senses start to turn off. Even in a lighter kind of meditation where samadhi is just starting to build, you can feel that the body starts to feel a lot less solid. It starts to feel kind of diffuse. You know, the sensations start to almost melt away or you feel them almost like uh, vibrations or wavelets. Yeah, And everything starts to become very obviously ethereal, ephemeral not really substance, it's, there's no substance there, substance less, we can say. Mm. And so how can this be a self? And yet it's really interesting when the more um, uh, fabricated kinds of emotions arise, you know, especially uh, for me, I had quite a bit of uncertainty. And of course, one of the hallmarks of monastic life is uncertainty because, you know, you renounce the usual uh, delusionary types of security in the world. I actually uh, defined what a renunciate means to me as um, one who voluntarily renounces apparent physical security to embrace uncertainty, to meet and understand suffering, and to uncover the illusion of a self with the triple gem as refuge and Dhamma Vinaya as guide. So it's a voluntary move into un uncertainty. Yeah? And this was the first place that the Buddha was a big rebel. You know? He actually went against the expectations of his family, of his caste and of the world. And okay, you can say that India was always a land of you know, spiritual seeking and uh, renunciates. There was such a thing as samanas even in those days, although they were mostly from various sects. Um, the Brahmana sect, the Brahmins and uh, all kinds of other ascetics, the Jains were already there, I think, before the Buddha. Um, so it was an understood thing, but still he had to face a huge amount of uncertainty compared to, you know, the luxury and the security that he'd been living in before. But for him, that had become a prison. So there was a kind of turning away from the world. And that is a rebellion, you know, you, you have to be open to anything. And really, it's in uncertainty that we have a chance to grow, we have a chance to change. If everything is predictable, and if we know exactly what we're going to do, and it's going to be similar to what we did yesterday, then there's not as much opportunity to grow. And I ordained, you know, myself, I was a rebel. I went to India at 19 with a one-way ticket and 200 quid. <laughs> I had a ticket on to Thailand. Oh, yeah, ticket onto Thailand, but that was it. It landed there. It ended there. <laughs> and, you know, that was a, a physical renunciation and an unburdening of physical security in a sense. Um, and this retreat, you know, the uncertainty came up as to what I'm doing in my monastic life, like what's going to happen next? How is it going to happen next? With whom is it going to happen next? Where will it happen next? You know, all those kind of questions. Um, will my monastic life be viable? Will it be fulfilling? Will I ever get enlightened and all this kind of stuff? And people might think, gosh, they sound like uh, first world concerns. Maybe they might, but actually when you have no money that you can use yourself and you're not supposed to cook, you know, this is a big uh, step outside societal norms. People don't understand what it means to be a monastic in the West most of the time. I mean, of course, there are people raised in Buddhist cultures who have a little bit more understanding, and hopefully you're all getting brainwashed by now. <laughs> but, um, but it's a challenge, you know, and sometimes it was interesting to see that when emotions of um, loneliness or anxiety would arise, even though I thought I was very good at staying present with the sensations and the emotions, you know, just as they are, my mind would start to run away into thought. And I realized that this thinking is just another way of um, not, sort of dissociating, actually, avoiding the situation, you know, going into thought instead. Yeah. 
um, even just spinning out by reading articles or, you know, going and sitting in the garden for a cup of tea. Sometimes that's great. And it resources us. Sometimes we're running away because there's this subtle resistance to feeling what we feel. And so I learned to just, when I realized that was happening, I just started to turn inward much more and to stay present with that and to start to question some of those thoughts because I could really clearly see that um, whatever emotion arises, I don't know if you find this, but say loneliness arises, we immediately draw on as many past experiences as we can to prove to ourselves, <laughs> to validate our case that we you know, are lonely, we've always been lonely, we deserve to be lonely, that's a worse thought, uh, that's a really painful thought, um, but we're going to be lonely, you know, forevermore, and then we conjure up all these fantasies about the future, right, to reinforce why we should be lonely and why that's really valid, when really all we're doing is running away from just being present with loneliness, <laughs> just turning gently toward that experience. And this is the, first, the second, I would say, big rebellion of the Buddha. You know, everyone else tends, tells us to turn outward, turn away, distract ourselves. you know, make ourselves feel better, put metta on top. And, you know, sometimes it can be skillful, but sometimes it's a kind of band-aid solution. Sometimes what's needed is to really gently just turn toward. Mm -hmm. And this is where I also developed this idea of love language to the mind or love language for the mind. I mean, of course, it's just another way of saying kind and gentle in a speech, you know, and I just say to my mind, you know, dear mind, you know, you're really, I really respect you. I trust you. We're in this together. We're in this together. That was really nice. Telling my mind that we're in this together because that made me feel less alone. And it was really remarkable that once I started turning towards this and re recognizing the way the thoughts were just trying to, you know, keep me spinning, keep me fabricating stories and whole universes that would reconfirm that feeling. Um, once I really could be present with it, it didn't take long at all to get into a much more peaceful place. And this kind of peace felt much more inclusive. It felt deeper. It felt more durable compared to the kind of peace that can happen when we're maybe say more focused and we're sort of shutting a lot of our experience out. It can be helpful at times, but I think when there is stuff to be seen that will only last for a while before that stuff has to be seen, it has to come up again. And so this kind of way for me was really powerful. And I realized that that was the Buddha's third big rebellion because he did ask us to turn towards suffering, but he didn't ask us to stop at that. What he said was to turn toward it in order to see its nature, in order to see its true nature, you know, and to understand why we make it so personal, why we cling to this fabricated sense of self. Mm -hmm. So when we turn inward toward these things, and we actually do start to notice that their nature is that they are unsatisfactory or at least not fulfilling, you know, not a source of lasting happiness and peace. We see that anything in the sense world, especially thinking in this particular example, you know, it is uh, conditioned. I build it up. You know, it's like a child has Lego and they go to the Lego box and like they build something like a really scary kind of Lego monster. I don't know if that exists, but you can imagine a Lego monster. You, I don't know, you make it with bulgy eyes and kind of sharp spiky hairdo or something. <laughs> and then the child looks at that piece of Lego, that Lego monster, ah, ah, what was that? And forgets that they actually created it themselves, right? But when we see that we created it ourselves, it's like, oh, okay, so, I can kind of disassemble it as well. And later, you know, you get cleverer. So, okay, you still might get into the habit of creating these things, but then you look at it and you realize, oh, actually it's not a solid thing. It has all these joins and, you know, it has all these separate pieces of Lego. So it's not actually a monster. <laughs> it's just this thing made of bricks. And after a while, you know, we might still play around with the Lego. But it kind of becomes quite pointless. After a while, we just think, what's the point of that anymore, actually? 
And it's a little bit similar with these insights. Once we see that these things are just impermanent, we fabricate them, you know, we fabricate and create our own worlds. Like while I was lonely, I created this world where nobody really liked me and everyone was hostile and, <laughs> and they were kind of, I don't know, had all kinds of feelings <laughs> that of course they don't have, right? And, uh, you know, <laughs> and then when you're feeling a bit better, you create a different world where actually everybody's really friendly and you're really friendly and you can't wait to see this person and that person. And after a while, you just don't believe any of it anymore, you know. And so because of this, we don't spend so much time playing around in that world. And it's not like, uh, you know, we kind of uh, look down on that world or, or, you know, look down on anyone else who's going through these things because we understand how it happens, but we're just kind of fed up with it. And, and then this thing called Nibida arises. And this is the kind of deeper type of letting go. This is even deeper than just letting be, you know, first we turn towards suffering to have a look at what it is, how it's created, but we don't stop there. You know, we see it for what it is. And the Buddha says that it's from yata bhuta jnana dasana that nibida arises. Yata bhuta jnana dasana means um, to see things as they really are. You know, the wisdom that sees things as they really are. And when we see that, we just get tired of playing around. It's like a child gets tired of toys. You know, it doesn't condemn those toys. It's just it stops going to the toy box <laughs> as much as, you know, they used to go. And they start enjoying other things instead. I don't know what a child progresses onto. I suppose playing with friends, real people. <laughs> yeah. And then they start going to school and enjoying their own mind and, or, you know, enjoying doing some maths or some sums or, I don't know, sticking their hand up in class or <laughs> different things at different times. So they're not condemning what they used to do, but they're just not interested anymore. And it's similar with this. So we have to see things as they really are. And then this natural, natural um, power power force really inside the mind called nibida turns us away from that world it turns us away but at the same time it has and it imparts a beautiful sense of peace because it's turning us simultaneously towards peace towards inner happiness away from the five sense world and towards the happiness of the mind a happiness that is uh, less fabricated it's still conditional it's still conditioned but it's calmer and more peaceful in nature, more sublime. And so we start to get a taste for that, you know, and sometimes I'm sure that in, in everybody's meditation, you've experienced times when things are, you know, a little bit more peaceful, less solid, the anxiety has kind of gone down, or maybe even there's some joy arising. You feel, oh, I could just keep sitting. I could sit here for, you know, the next hour or however long, maybe you don't even want to take your lunch and, you know, you just wish you didn't have to kind of go and pick up the kids or <laughs> make the dinner or get go to work, whatever it is, you know, and this is because you're starting to get a taste for the beautiful peace in the mind. Mm -hmm. And this is really the, um, the easiest way, I think, and this is how it's possible to give up a sense of self or to give up the illusion of a sense of self, because it's scary to do that. You know, we cherish who we think we are. We've developed it. We've cultivated it. We carry on trying to promote it to the world, you know. And as I say, we don't really want to see through it. We want to exist. We want to continue. We want to feel there's some destination for us somewhere happy in the future, right? Even if we're suffering, even if we're suffering intensely, we'd still rather suffer than let go. But the way we can let go, the reason we can let go is because by doing so, we incrementally um, deepen our peace and it's a different kind of happiness. So I think that's probably quite a lot. Um, but I just wanted to encourage and remind everybody, you know, that the purpose of this practice is to turn toward the difficulties. It's to broaden our understanding of suffering until we can see the whole realm, the whole field of suffering in and all around. You know, it's that pervasive nature that has to be understood. And 
it can be scary and we shouldn't go in all at once. You know, we go in baby steps. We don't just jump into an ocean. Like I wouldn't recommend anybody doing a long retreat until they've done it for years. And I've been doing this for 25 years, you know, at the age of, I don't know, 25, I was doing 30 day retreats and you're completely in solitude. You're not even allowed to look at anybody and you're sitting for 12 hours a day, but there's a container, you know, there's a structure and you work toward it. Even with that, even with that, you know, I can sit here now and still have, you know, difficult times, have challenging emotions arise. And there can be this subtle kind of feeling, oh, oh dear, what's wrong? You know, this shouldn't be happening to me. (laughs) And I think for me, it was really humbling and also an opportunity again to realize that we're absolutely conditioned, but we're absolutely products of our environment, you know, the particular circumstance we find ourselves in. And I know I'm not alone in this, you know, I'm no, even at the um, LGBTQIA plus uh, uh, conference today, one of my friends, another monk was there, And he's a gay monk. And he also talked about, you know, having very dark thoughts at times where he felt marginalized, where he felt excluded. And having this sense of, is there something wrong with me before realizing, yeah, this is the impact of, uh, you know, inequity, inequality, of feeling you don't belong, feeling you're not really valued, really loved, really, you know, okay as you are. And, um, and how that can cause a kind of sense of cognitive dissonance when at the same time you have to show up, you know, shiny in your robes and inspire everyone. And I think it's kind of really important for monastics to be able to show up and really uh, discuss their inner experience because we're human beings, you know. And so sometimes I just notice that I have this um, expectation of myself especially when people say I hope you've had a peaceful retreat and it's meant beautifully and I hope I've had a peaceful retreat but actually who am I to know what I need right now and it's very interesting coming out of retreat just to end um, to notice that I think I've had to develop a lot of new tools and actually really sharpen up some of the old ones and now because Relatively speaking, a lot is happening in this five sense world. I mean, it's not that much compared to most people yet. I'm coming in quite gently. It's maybe, I don't know, it's probably at least 10 emails. Yeah, it's probably quite a lot already. Uh, (laughs) But when I sit down to meditate, the mind is so peaceful because relative to that activity in the outside, I realize, wow, I've developed some a real sense of strength, of inner strength. And actually there's a lot of quiet there. But sometimes we don't realize when the environment outside us is very, very, very silent. You know, wherever we're not silent gets sort of magnified. But uh, as I say, it was a very interesting retreat, a little bit of everything. And I don't want to, uh, I guess I just wanted to talk more about that insight part because there is a different way than always going back to the breath, going back to the metta. Sometimes we have to get right in there with the emotion, you know. This same teacher said to me, all contemplatives, if you read their stories, their lives, they had to go through like deep, dark periods of loneliness, desperate loneliness. And it's those places that sometimes you don't inflict them on yourself, but sometimes they're those places that the breakthroughs happen, you know because that's where we really develop our strengths. So I'm finding it's going to be very interesting to come out now and start connecting with people again. And with, yeah, a lot of practice (laughs) in the last four months Um, and a real continuity actually, despite whatever was happening, the continuity was there. And uh, also it's humbling to see that, yeah, there are these tendencies to spin off, to dissociate, to kind of, I don't really mean dissociate because that's not what I tend to do. What is it when you um, uh, distract or I suppose it is a kind of dissociation when you go into your mind and away from your direct experience in the present. So I would like to leave some time everybody or anybody or somebody some of you to ask any questions to um yeah anything at all share your experience it's a long time since we've met that would be great (laughs) and 
yeah, we can, I guess, stop. Do we stop the, no, we keep me pinned, isn't it, Renny, I think? Is it Renny recording? And so only your voices will be recorded, but if you don't want your voice to be recorded, if you're shy or anything like that, you can put it in the box. I'm not going to read people's names uh, unless, I mean, I don't see that you really need me to if it's in the box. So, uh, you know, it's not like anybody listening is going to know who you are, but if you want it to be even more confidential, just send it privately to me, okay? Thank you. Yes, Janaki would like to speak. Hi, Janaki. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chandra, uh, will there be any more programs before the 31st <laughs> of uh, October? No, uh, not this week. week. I know I know you're really excited for the Sutta class, right? Is that yes, right? that's right. Oh, <laughs> I'm so glad you are, and I hope you can wait just a little bit longer because um, I have to move from this place in about like a week after the 31st and there's quite a lot happening like in that week I want to try and get the schedule worked out basically and then write a newsletter with a bit more a lot more information about the project about our next steps about lots of things so I'm going to take it easy for the next well not that easy but yes I will take that week to get the newsletter and the schedule together and they'll be starting basically after I move on the 7th so probably the following week would be what the 13th or 12th something like 12th the 12th I think it'll be the 12th yeah it'll be the 12th of November it will happen it will happen I'm very glad you're so enthusiastic thank you so much <laughs> yeah and also I'm planning to do um the meta meditation I mean it's not going to be every every week because I've also got retreats to teach and stuff so you know there'll be some weeks that it has to skip but I'm planning for the meta group. You know, we have the Saturday meta group. I thought we've done so much of that particular type of way of practice. What we're going to do, well, what I suggest is um, meta and the seven bojangas, the seven factors of awakening. So how meta can inform and enrich and how those factors of awakening can inform and enrich meta. So we'll do that because there's a lovely sutta in the bojanga samyutta that says that metta should accompany all the seven bojangas, the seven awakening factors, mindfulness, um, investigation of the Dhamma. Um, hmm, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah, then it's, uh, is it joy? I think it might be piti then and pasadi and upeka. I think it must be joy, pamoja, piti, pasadi, uh, upeka. Is that right? Yeah. So we look at them and try to, just to invoke them a little bit in the meta practice. Anything else? Has Marika got her? Is that a sign? Yes, please. Good evening. Hi. That's your candle, by the way. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> Smells very nice. Oh, good. I'm glad. It's lovely to see you again. <laughs> nice to see um, you. I have a question about letting go of the self. Uh -huh. um, uh, do you think that with your retreat that, that, that you experience that letting go of the self? And, and do you think that that is something that a lay person can work with? Thanks for or, the not maybe work with but sort of you know because i i kind of uh, i have had times when um i've experienced thoughts and understand what you were saying about constructing mm. uh, a sort of a, a, an illusion for yourself about how you're feeling um but i think there is a difference between just understanding that and actually truly believing it and feeling it yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whether there's a difference or whether it's just a, a sort of a trajectory that we're moving on. Um, 
first of all, in the way you asked the question, I guess the way I would phrase it is more that not that we um, give up the self, but that we see the self as a delusion. We see <laughs> that we're um, giving something a reality that it doesn't deserve, that it doesn't actually have. So it's not that there's nothing there. It's not that we're not an individual sort of entity. I mean, I don't have your karma, you don't have mine. I have to live out my own karma according to my cause and effect, whatever process. It's just that we claim that as our process. It's like, oh, okay, so I can see it's a process, but it's my process. <laughs> and I think as we deepen our understanding of cause and effect, basically, paticca samapada, dependent origination, the way things arise. And I gave the example of thinking and the way a thought can arise based on a feeling, maybe in the body, especially around the heart sometimes, or the belly, and then thought arises that's in alignment with, or that's of the same sort of uh, tone, emotional tone as that. And then from there, we sort of make that about me and build sort of an identity imagine myself in a world that feels like that and how I'm going to be <laughs> or how I have been you know and it's that part of it that we're trying to come out of actually sort of claiming ownership of these things um, so it's not that these things don't arise anymore although there won't be as much fuel behind it at all <laughs> um, it'll be more like uh, you'll see it more like natural phenomena arising due to causes and conditions. And I think it's when we start to understand that what those causes and conditions are that we stop believing in them so much. They stop bothering us so much because if there's a cause that can also be, that cause can be removed, right? So, you know, for example, if um, I'm causing suffering by reacting to that emotion, I can start to lessen suffering by just staying present and welcoming that emotion instead. So in these ways, we just start to calm things down and the sense of self becomes more and more kind of ethereal. Ajahn Brahm gives a really beautiful simile that I've only ever heard him give once and it's in a rain's talk to the monks. And he says, it's like, um, when you're in the world, and this is general, okay, because all of us can be this way. He says, it's like, uh, um, you're like the fire element, you know, the senses are burning. <laughs> We're burning with craving, with aversion, with anger, you know, all kinds of things. And of course, we all go through that from time to time. And, uh, you know, in ordinary daily life, it's just that you're more solid, you know, you're like the solid element. There's this very solid sense of this is me, you know, I'm okay with you as long as you sort of stay at a certain distance from me or don't say things that offend me in any way or, you know, you don't challenge who I think I am. Especially if you're intelligent, someone says you're stupid or you're sensitive, someone says you're insensitive, this really hurts, right? It challenges who we think we are. And then he says that uh, that's your common person in the world who's not a, a stream winner. And then a little bit later, the stream, once you, be, well, maybe a lot later, you become a stream enterer, you experience, you basically understand dependent origination, that there isn't actually a being in here. It's a process of cause and effect. And at that point, um, you become like water, you become like the water element. So there's still sort of a shape, but it can flow into any container that it needs to flow into. And I can see this with certain teachers, no names, <laughs> but they really can adapt their you know, way of being according to the situation. If they are on their own, they become the ideal hermit. If they're you know, in a noisy room, they make peace with the noise. The first time I was on retreat with Ajahn Brown, for example, it was a very, um, <clears throat> it was a Samadhi retreat as usual with him. I mean, it was a meditation retreat. I'm not allowed to say it was samadhi as opposed to insight. But anyway, <laughs> I guess I was getting quite calm. So I was enjoying like, you know, samadhi practice. And then we went, he was going to give a talk in Frankfurt during the retreat. And I was thinking, should I go? Uh, I shouldn't go because I'm enjoying my meditation. But I think I should be around Ajahn Brown because there's always something to learn. So maybe I should go. And yeah, but it'd be noisy. Maybe I should. Anyway, I went. <laughs> and then we were in this very noisy kind of foyer area with probably 200 people talking really loudly and it was really painful I said wow 
doesn't this like hurt? I mean, I said, how do you stay so cool with this? It's like, it's, I'm really sensitive, you know? He said, yeah, you know, you just make peace. And he was completely on phase. I was like, okay, yeah, all right, let's make peace. So we just sat down, relaxed. But I thought that was very cool, you know? They could just go straight from that into a noisy environment. So, and he can, he, he, he can't really pin these people down. You can't say they're like this or they're like that. It seems more to me that when the defilements of the mind are becoming overcome, <laughs> can say becoming overcome, um, the beautiful qualities of the Brahma Vihara start to manifest more and more. And that is what sort of defines, if you like, that becomes that person's energy in the world. And then he says that when you become like a, I don't know, not when you become, but when the insight of, or when the stage of anagami happens, so an anagami is the uh, third stage of enlightenment, where there's no more aversion or craving, in other words, no lust. Um, he says it's like you're the mist, you know, you're barely there, you're barely there. Like someone could poke the mist, it doesn't affect it in any way you know it doesn't uh, impact it in any way and then when you're fully enlightened you're just like space not even space you know sort of there's really barely anything there they say the arahat leaves no footsteps in the sky <laughs> it's very nice so they really tread lightly on this world so it's gradual but yes i mean in short that was a long answer in short Lay people can also see through the illusion of a self. Absolutely, in degrees. And if you're anything like me, you'll see sometimes it'll get very, very light. You know, there'll be a very light sense of self, hardly much there. And then at other times it becomes more consolidated. It, it also, unfortunately, seems to depend on how much we do. Like Ajahn Brahm always says, there's these two main parts of the self, the doer and the knower. So we define ourselves by what we do. Um, I feel much more solid, you know, when I'm busy, busy, busy all day, a uh, bit more brittle, you know. And then when I'm on retreat, I can be just floating around. I don't have to be anybody for any, or anything for anybody. You know, no one's gonna talk to me. So I can just kind of disappear. So there'll be times when it's stronger, times when it's, I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. James I, thought, I think I saw a question. Sorry. James. Oh, yeah. I just want to go to the chat box because I think somebody asked uh, and they haven't really been here before. Is it a couple of, oh, quite a few. If you don't mind, James, would that be okay? Because I'm reading questions by people that I don't think have written in questions before. So somebody's asking about the times and dates. So the best thing would be uh, to Pacific time. Yeah, it's tricky, Pacific time. No, we do have mostly our events in the evening, yes. And if you sign up for our newsletter or you look on our website, it's uh, someone could put it in the chat, I'm sure, if not already done. Okay. So I'll just read through these. And Sorry, I did give a long answer to the last one. When thoughts or emotions come up in meditation that are unwholesome, is it better to observe them closely or is it better to sometimes push them away so they can't gain strength and power? Great, because this was a part of my talk that I had to skip. And in the Buddhist text, it's really nice because it's both, but it's not pushing away. It's identifying that they're unwholesome, that they're not going to do you any good. But then there's a very nice, gentle kind of way to shoo them off. And that is the simple phrase, Mara, I know you. Okay, so Mara is in Buddhism, the personification of kind of craving, aversion, delusion, the whole lot. <laughs> and Mara is always trying to take you away from your meditation. And Mara can actually get much more um, active when you're getting closer, you know. So this is why sometimes when you have more of a storm in your practice, it's actually a good sign because Mara's getting scared, you know, you're getting close, you're getting close to a breakthrough or to a deep meditation and Mara's coming in to say, you can't do it, you're bad, don't even carry on in robes, you know. <laughs> and it happened to me, not exactly those thoughts, but um, 
And uh, I just said, oh yeah, Mara, Mara, I know you, but that didn't actually work. So what I had to do at one point is just say, what a joke, you know, what a total joke, which was a little bit stronger. But I was really getting tired of these kind of detrimental, unhelpful thoughts. And I just said, what a joke. And I decided to start laughing. Now, I don't know that this is always going to work for everyone, but I started to make myself laugh. And I was like, just, ha, ha, you know, and I actually, not always when I was in the middle of a distressing thought, but sometimes I did it to myself when I felt really good. So if I was having a peaceful day, nice day, I have a cup of tea. I remember that thought, bring it in my mind and purposely laugh at it. I said, what a joke, that's ridiculous, you know. And I carried on doing this until I started to develop a nice association, like a funny, it was actually making me laugh. And this was a thought that made me cry before. I remember telling Ajahn Brahm my thought, my unwholesome thought, not thinking I should even tell him. And when I told him, oh, no. <laughs> weeping, you know, kind of with shame, I suppose. And, uh, and then after doing that with it, it, I just laughed at it. So that was quite good. So yeah, you're not exactly pushing because that would be a version. It has to come from a sort of understanding and a wisdom and a sort of knowing the right measure. Yeah. Um, I think worry doesn't really help. Now you're saying, so they can't gain strength and power. That sounds like a worry. They generally don't, actually, if you ignore them. There's a sutta in the, the Majjhima Nikaya number 19, and uh, there are different methods there to, what to say, pacify, or to, let's say to allow unwholesome thoughts to disappear. And one of them is just ignore them. Let them kind of be there. So don't give them much attention and just carry on anyway. So that also freaks Mara out because Mara wants to stop people getting out of samsara. Okay, please go Vivian. Yes, it's lovely to see you. If you've gone, you're still receiving Meta. <laughs> uh, Sophie has a question. Sorry, I said I wouldn't read anyone's name. <laughs> How do you know when to stay with what you're feeling and when to use something like Meta? Yeah, you just have to try, I think. You just have to try. I mean, this was a really long retreat, so the meta was fine, you know, when I used it. It's just that because the same things kept arising, not all the time, but because it's four months, you know, might not have anything arise that's difficult for two weeks, but then the same theme would arise after two weeks again, and it would be just as bad or just as difficult. So then I realized that um, meta alone was probably not enough. At times it was, you know, great. Uh, but something deeper, something more investigative was needed there. And to really notice that there was a resistance, that whatever I was using was, yeah, I was doing it, but there was a, a very subtle resistance. I mean, I am talking about subtleties here. It's like sometimes you can feel it in your body. It's just slightly sort of on edge. Like Even if it's not your muscles, it's like almost like the skin is slightly tense or the membranes around your organs are like slightly, does this make any sense? It's ever so subtle. And you just realize there's a slight resistance there. Let me just get closer rather than keeping it a distance because when you keep it at that distance it's just making it more solid and more of an issue so how do you know when to stay with what you're feeling and use something like metta yeah you can also use metta towards what you're feeling you can stay with what you're feeling with a, a real sense of like i say you're really welcome here you know oh if you're feeling sad that's really okay. I'm here with you, you know, and you imagine yourself like being with the sadness, like a really kind mom or best friend. So you can practice in different ways. So you're not using meta or intellectual thinking to avoid what you're feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I hope that uh, what I said helped. I think it's trial and error, you know, and where we make mistakes is where we learn. They're not really mistakes. It's just we try different ways and every situation is so different. So I suppose it's getting to know your own mind, getting to know yourself, how things work. And uh, 
the meta has to become genuine, you know. It has to be more than just saying a few words or imagining it. It has to become so inclusive that it really doesn't, you know, stigmatize any any of your emotional world. You know, the more we can hold space for our own emotional world, the more available we are to other people, right? If people haven't processed their emotions, then they kind of get freaked out when anyone else has an emotion. It's really uncomfortable to be around. So if we learn to listen to ourselves, we learn to listen to our own inner world, we can listen to others too. Sometimes it's nice to use that perception, you know, think of it just like as though you're listening to someone else. Oh, how are you today? And then your body, your mind are telling you how you are. It's that identification with it that makes it hard to be with because we think it's ours, you know. So when we realize this is just a phenomenon, we can actually move in towards, towards it with curiosity. So it's like, oh, what's this? What's this arising? Let me see. That's why it's good not to have agendas for retreats because something else might arise. And if you only wanted this or that and you were aiming for this or this, you won't notice what perhaps, you know, opportunities for growth lie in what's actually arising for you, which may be exactly where you need to work. And I actually think it is exactly where you need to work, and that's why it's arising. Having said that, I don't mean just sit through anything. Get the support you can, okay, when things are difficult. Okay, so um, I think that's all the questions in the box. So if James still wants to ask something, you may. I've read all the messages, even the ones that are not to be read out. James. Over time. Um, can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, <coughs> Dramatically. <laughs> I, love, I love what you said about um, finding those maybe unwholesome or disturbing thoughts funny, because that's something I found really useful. I'm, I'm prone to coming up with these catastrophic thoughts. And previously, I've just let them go round and round and round, probably, I think, probably not even realising I'm doing it. And they drag me down, but I've, I've mm -hmm. learned now to recognise them, obviously, but sometimes they're just so ridiculous that rather than letting them get me down, I just, I do laugh. It's just like, yeah, you know, why is my mind doing this to me? It's just, <laughs> like, you know, it's almost comical. It's yes. Yeah, yeah, it's one, one of many, many useful tools to deal with life, isn't it? Great. Um, but, yeah, perhaps I'll just leave it at a comment. It's nine o'clock now, so. <laughs> okay, I'm sure I'll see you at the next event. <laughs> Thank you, James. And um, just to say, yeah, there are thoughts that are just quite funny anyway. Like, they're ridiculous, and that's why they're funny. In this case, it was a thought that wasn't funny, actually, at all. It was like quite scary. And um, yeah, even there, even there, sometimes we can actually learn to laugh. <laughs> even there, yeah. So not buying into these things, isn't it? Not buying into any of it, because I mean, one of the lessons for me is that I really don't know. I really, really can't judge anything. I can't judge anyone. I can't judge myself. I can't gauge where I am on the path. We have no idea. We just don't know. And it doesn't matter. And that's quite a nice thought, but we really don't know. <laughs> you know, we might get enlightened next week. We might get enlightened when we die. We might get enlightened in 20 lives or maybe 20,000. But one thing we know is we're at least on the path. So I always think this is one of the great things about monastic life, encouraging any of you now, that uh, I always said to myself, you know, right from the beginning, actually before I even, I think maybe on my first retreat, I don't know. I was about 19 anyway. And I thought, you know, I can give one life for, to be a nun. I can give one life to be a nun. I mean, so many lives. I don't know. I had an instinct that there were many lives. I thought at least one life I can give to be a nun, let's do it. Because, you know, doing that, later more understanding came that doing that um, would make it far more likely to, for me to incline in that direction again and again and again and again, hopefully. Not too many agains, maybe not any agains, but, um, <laughs> you know, that, that yeah, 
we're on this path and that's already a big deal. So even if you're not a monastic, whether you're a monastic or not, the practice that you're doing now is a very good predictor, almost a guarantee, I'd say, that you're going to continue for the rest of your existence in samsara. So that's a nice thought to end on. So maybe we should end there. And it's very lovely to see you all. I haven't really said that yet, but I do want to thank everybody, whether you were directly, indirectly involved in supporting my retreat. Some of you were as volunteers, some of you as just, you know, wishing me well, some of you sending flowers, sending <laughs> deliveries. And, you know, it's just amazing little cards. Um, I mean, not many this time, I must say. Now you're thinking, we didn't have her address because we really didn't, um, we didn't really, yeah, give many people the address, mainly because I didn't want the host to be getting all my, lots and lots of stuff to deliver to me, you know. So, um, so, but you're all there and that means a lot. And it is really nice to reconnect and feel that we have a community. So I'll write a newsletter and you'll hear the news. And you'll hear that we are moving towards hopefully getting a place in not so long. It's just a matter of the right thing coming up, really. So, very good. <laughs> good. So, shall we unmute? Shall we stop recording?